This morning, as we sort of conclude the Easter section of our journey through the Gospel of John, uh, for those of you who are, who are newer to us, we've been going through the Gospel of John. We kind of jumped forward to do the Easter stuff in John during the Easter season of our calendar year. So next week, we'll go all the way back to John chapter 15 and pick up the stuff that we leapt over uh, to get here. But as we wrap this up, we have this fascinating story of Jesus and Peter that is the, <clears throat> the add-on to the end of the Gospel of John. And I think if we're going to enter into this honestly, then we need to enter into it personally. And so I want to give you just a couple of moments, not morbid introspection, but a couple of moments just to yourself to process this question. What are a couple of or the thing in your life that you're most embarrassed of? What is, as you would label it, the great failure of your life? What is something you wish you hadn't done? See, for most of us, that question isn't hard to come up with an answer to, is it? Because those things are deeply etched in our minds. And any number of things can bring them rising right to the surface of our thoughts and of our lives. And this morning we encounter an interaction with Jesus and Peter where Peter's great failure is fresh in his mind. And Jesus is going to do some interesting things. And we're going to have to ask some honest questions of the text to make sense of exactly what's going on here. But before we get there, let's just remember the moments that Peter had leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus. They're recorded in John chapter 18. We won't take time to read them this morning, but feel free in your personal time to re-engage them. Many of you are familiar with this story. But Jesus, or the, the, the lead up to the crucifixion begins, of course, with that final Passover meal of Jesus and his disciples where Jesus announces that one of his disciples is going to betray him. And Peter, being uh, the impetuous person that he is, says, never me. I would never do it. And he goes on to say, even if every single one of these other people turns against you, I never will. And Jesus says to him, "Mm, before the night's over, You will turn your back on me, not once, not twice, but three times. Because before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Jesus, of course, is arrested in the garden. He's hauled off in chains to his trials. And Peter and another disciple, we're told, follow at a distance And outside the area where the trial is happening, there is a fire where people are warming themselves. It's a charcoal fire, John tells us about. And around that circle of people, Peter begins to get recognized. Hey, weren't you the guy who was with the guy they just brought in here in chains? Peter says, no, it wasn't me. Denial number one. And then another person comes to him and says, I'm certain that I saw you with him. And Peter, perhaps a little stronger, says, no, I wasn't with him. And then a third time, someone says, I know that you're one of his followers. And John says he denied them again. And then the rooster crowed. In some other accounts, we have the picture of Jesus and Peter making eye contact at that moment. In fact, in Mark's Gospel, I believe, it could have been one of the other synoptics, we're given even more insight into what's going on here in that in the the progression of the denials of Peter of Jesus, they get stronger and stronger each time to the point that at the third denial, it says that Peter called down curses. In essence, damn me if this isn't true. Now, what that curses mean, it could be curses on himself. Some scholars even suggest he's so far trying to distance himself from Jesus, he's calling curses down on Jesus. 
We don't know, but we know this isn't a good thing. The rooster crows. Peter is shamed. Jesus is crucified. And the rest is history. And then we come to John chapter 21. If you have a copy of the Scriptures, you can turn there. We'll have it on the screen for you as well. And I want to read through these 25 verses. It's kind of a lengthy section, but I just want to read through them. And then afterwards, just kind of process them together. And ask the question, what's actually going on here? This is what John writes. He says, Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples. If you remember, if you remember John chapter 20, Jesus has appeared already twice to his disciples by showing up into the room where they were gathered. So afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. So now they're no longer in Jerusalem. They're back up north. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was him. He called out to them, friends, haven't you caught any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw the fire burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat, dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew that it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, John, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to them, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had, leaned, who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? And Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, that's what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things, who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. The Word of God for the people of God. 
Now, what on earth is going on in this bizarre story of sorts? Jesus shows up to make breakfast for the disciples and has a weird conversation with Peter. How, how do we make sense of all of this in light of what's happening here? Well, what I want to suggest to you is that Jesus is restoring Peter. He's restoring him back to his original status, as it were. We could say it like this in pretty basic language. Jesus is forgiving Peter. And when I say forgiving, I mean in the fullness of the term. But we have to read into this a little bit to really make sense of what's going on here. Because there's much more than simply Jesus showing up and saying, hey man, what she did, don't worry about it. That doesn't happen, right? The story could have went that way. It doesn't happen like that at all. It also doesn't happen like Peter getting out of the boat and swimming to Jesus and saying, I really screwed up, please forgive me. That doesn't happen either. Right? Those are the ways we understand forgiveness most of the way in our life. Instead, we have this, this conversation that we have to sort of get inside and understand what's really happening. And in all of the scene, do you see what Jesus is doing? Jesus has recreated the scene of Peter's denial. Do you see it? I mean, in every single way, Right? He, he gave them drink and he broke the meat with them. They're having this meal together in the very same way. And then he starts his question to Peter by saying, do you still love me more than all of these? The very same way Peter had in overconfidence blurted out that he would never deny Jesus. And oh, by the way, this whole meal is happening around what? A charcoal fire, the same place where Peter had issued all of his denials. And the very most prominent thing is the resurrected Jesus bearing the scars of his crucifixion standing right there in front of him. There is no escaping his failure, is it? Jesus has made it blatantly clear. So we have to pause and ask a question. What is Jesus doing? Is he vindictive? Is he bitter? Does he really want to just force his nose into this mess up to really make him feel it more? Is that what's going on? The, te- the context doesn't really tell us, so we have to, when we're interpreting Scripture, bring to bear what we know about Jesus from all the other places, and we can confidently conclude this is not who Jesus is. This is what he does. Instead, this must be part of of a means to attempt to reach Peter where he's at. I want to suggest to you that this whole section, this whole interesting conversation, is Jesus digging off the outer layers so that he can ultimately get to the heart of Peter, so that Peter has the opportunity to respond to the forgiveness that Jesus had already intended to offer him. This isn't about... Jesus making Peter do penance. It's about Jesus getting Peter to the place where he can honest to goodness ask for and receive forgiveness. Here's the deal, friends. If you do not feel the weight of your sin, if you do not feel the weight of your brokenness, you cannot embrace the full weight of the grace of God. For many of us, we are flippant about our brokenness. We believe Jesus forgives, and that is true. But we don't really taste the fullness and the goodness of His forgiveness because we don't own up to the gravity of our brokenness. the amount or the level to which you understand the weight and the pain of your brokenness is the amount or the level to which you will feel the fullness of the grace of God. Moreover, we have learned in our Christian religion as well as in our human Western lives to simply ask for forgiveness so that it will go away. So that what we did just goes away. Right? We just want it to go away. 
But what Jesus wants to do is undo it. And those are two very different things. There was a pastor, um, a a scholar pastor in the 1930s, in uh, the early 1940s, of German descent named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Perhaps you're familiar with him. Uh, He was studying and he was working in the academy actually in New York, in the United States, as the Nazis began to rise to power and to dominance in Germany. And he decidedly chose to go back to his homeland to engage in the resistance against the Nazis and Nazism while everyone else was fleeing. And when he got there, he found something that utterly surprised him. Most of the Christians and most of the pastors or ministers were simply acquiescing to Nazi dominance and worse than that, Nazi propaganda and demeaning of Jewish people and demeaning of people of other races and all of these things. And it broke the heart of Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer was ultimately arrested by the Nazis for his resistance and for his outspokenness. And from prison wrote a number of books which I could encourage you to read, which are just astounding in their depth and in their significance. One of them was a book he wrote called The Cost of Discipleship. And in it, he coined the phrase cheap grace. You heard this phrase before? And by cheap grace, what he meant was if we don't understand the weight of our sin, then we simply, uh, we simply broker with God through the currency of cheap grace. And he had concluded that the reason the church had given themselves to the Nazism that had risen in his day was that they knew God would forgive them. That it'd be all right. On the other side, it was difficult. It was hard. And God's forgiving anyway. And if we just get through this, then on the other side. And Bonhoeffer's conclusion is that if we live by means of cheap grace, we can never become maturing disciples that discipleship will always cost us something. Not because God wants to exact it from us, but because the world is in opposition to it. Jesus is not offering Peter some semblance of cheap grace. He's purposely leading him back into this moment of his deepest failure. And then he turns and he asks him three questions, doesn't he? Again, mimicking his three denials, Jesus asks him three questions. And once again, mimicking Peter's three denials that increase in passion, his three answers to Jesus again increase in passion. We see the whole thing working itself out this way. But what does Jesus ask him? He doesn't say, hey man, do you believe you screwed up back there? Hey man, would you do it differently if you had a chance? He doesn't ask him any of that, does he? He says, hey, do you love me? What a bizarre question to ask at some level. And yet, it's exactly the right question, isn't it? And he asks him the first time, but he says alongside of it, do you love me more than these? Is Jesus digging at him? I don't know. If he's doing it, he's doing it for good and some level graciously. But what he's really asking him is, hey, listen, are you still with me? Are you still on this team? Do you still have the kind of vigor or zeal or passion that will lead you to make the kind of statements that you made? Peter says, you know that I love you. Jesus asks him a second time, do you love me? And I have to imagine at that moment, Peter is beginning to be frustrated, right? Because at some level, Jesus is doubting him. But listen, doesn't Jesus have every right to doubt him in this moment? I mean, let's just be honest. At the moment of denial, who did Peter love the most? He loved himself the most. 
So Peter asks again, and, or excuse me, Jesus asks again, and Peter says, you know that I love you. And then Jesus asks a third time. And John tells us Peter was hurt. I want to suggest to you again the NIV that we always read here because it typically is a super good translation and is really easy to read. I think once again, the NIV gets a little too interpretive and therefore kind of doesn't give us the true meaning that's happening here. The word is that Peter was grieved. Now when it says Peter was hurt, the translation we read is interpreting what his grief was about, wasn't it? We don't know that. The text doesn't tell us that. So we have to ask ourselves, what is he actually grieved about? Why is Peter grieved? Why is he grief-stricken? Why is he saddened? The word is like overwhelmed. It's not like angry at someone. It's just kind of over consumed by emotion. Could he be uh, grieved by Jesus? Maybe. But it doesn't make a whole lot of sense in the context, does it? Because anyone who had done what Jesus, or excuse me, had done what Peter had done, even three times being asked, would have to at some level understand the nature of being asked three times. It seems to me that Peter is grieved at himself, not at Jesus. And what I want to suggest to you is this thing, this moment changes everything. Why does, Peter, why does Jesus stop at three, three times of asking him? We could answer that a couple different ways. Well, one, he was always going to ask him three times because Peter denied him three times. Well, that's penance, and we don't really believe in that, right? We believe in a grace that Jesus gives that is not earned. And so Jesus isn't asking Peter to earn his forgiveness here. To me, that's, you know, that's not a fair way to interpret this. So then why stop at three? I want to suggest to you because... Jesus had finally broken through to Peter. He had finally shoveled all the stuff off the top and gotten to the raw part of Peter. The part where Peter was willing to, at some level, emote or be honest about how he was feeling about himself in the midst of all of this. See, Peter comes into this not just having disowned Jesus, but at some level having failed very publicly. At some level having not lived up to the high expectations he had set for himself. And there's no way he's not in his own head. You know it. Because earlier when you began to think about those big failures in your life. Some of which, by the way, nobody on this earth has ever or will ever know except you. Who is the one condemning you? It's you, isn't it? I'm not saying to you it wasn't wrong what you did, but I'm saying the thing that often keeps us from experiencing the fullness of the forgiveness of Jesus is actually ourselves. Because we have already condemned ourselves and therefore just want it to go away without actually having, having, giving Jesus permission to re-enter it with us and to work it through towards final restoration. I mean, are you anything like me? The last thing I ever want to do is relive my great failures. I want them to just go away. And at some level, I want the cheap grace version where they just disappear. (laughs) But there's no growth from that. There's no transformation in that. There's no gospel in that. If God is just a God who doesn't remember, is He really God? But if God is a God who has the power to actually forgive and therefore to not uh, not declare you guilty for something, then this is true gospel. 
And Peter finally has been broken raw and finally is ready at some level (laughs) to embrace forgiveness. And after all, Jesus was offering him forgiveness every single time, wasn't he? He said, Peter, do you love me more than these? You know that I love you. Great. Feed my lambs. That's an offer of forgiveness. Why does Jesus keep going on? Because it wasn't received. Peter, do you love me? You know that I love you. Good. Tend to my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Now grieved. Peter says, you know that I love you. You know all things. Could it be that part of what Jesus is actually asking is not, do you love me? But do you believe that I love you? And that Peter is going through the process of honestly dealing with his failure and wrestling with the reality of if he is worthy of the love of Jesus. And forgiveness is quite the same way. How do we know it's at this moment that Jesus broke through to Peter? Well, because then Jesus begins to give him some tough news, doesn't he? We wouldn't really, none of us would be able to understand any of what Jesus just told Peter unless John gave us the commentary on what it meant. Like, you used to dress yourself, but coming a time, someone else is going to stretch you out and dress you. That's weird. John's like, yeah, what he's talking about is he's going to die. How do you stretch your arms out to die in that age? Jesus is telling Peter, you're going to die by crucifixion, just like me. And don't, we don't have it recorded in the Scriptures. Church history does bear witness to the fact that Peter, like his Lord, was crucified but unlike his Lord, was unwilling to be crucified right side up, feeling that he was unworthy to die that way. He asked to be crucified upside down. How does that happen? A deeply transformed person. How do you go from fearing for your life, therefore denying Christ, to entering into the full sacrifice of your life. Because Peter on this seashore, for the first time, had actually understood everything Jesus had come to do. To undo what was broken in this world. To overturn condemnation and to offer full life. And Peter had found it. Look at the three ways that Peter is transformed in this. It's fascinating to me. Again, I tell you, please, John is an incredible storyteller. So pick up on his details when he's talking. I, uh, I'm not a fisherman by any means, and I'm certainly not a fisherman who wants to go fish out uh, in a sea or an ocean or anything like that. Uh, nor do I know what fishermen wear when they do this. But apparently in those days, they wore their underwear. Right, Because if you, if you followed with the beginning of this, they're stripped down to basically nothing. And I guess that makes sense. And then they cast the net on the other side because the guy from the shore tells them to do it. And they have this massive catch. And John tells to Peter, that's Jesus. And Peter is excited about this. He wants to go be where Jesus is. So he jumps out of the boat and he swims to him. But John gives us this interesting point of the story, doesn't he? He says, so he heard that. So what did he do? He put on all of his outer garments and jumped into the water and swam to him. Listen, if you're going to fish in your underwear, shouldn't you swim in your underwear? I've never known anyone who went and put on clothes to go swimming. Something's happening here. You remember that John is telling us that Jesus is offering new creation. Where else do we have it in the Bible where someone is ashamed of their denial and therefore they hide themselves by clothes? It's Genesis 3, isn't it? Where Adam and Eve, overcome by their shame, clothe themselves so they might not be found out by God. And here Peter clothes himself so that he might not be found out by Jesus. 
But what does God do to Adam and Eve? (laughs) He exposes them, doesn't he? And then what does Jesus do to Peter in this same moment? He says, hey, Peter, come over here. Do you still love me more than these? He begins exposing him. Why? Because we can't cover our shame. It still lives in profound ways underneath everything we try to bury it with. Shame only goes away when you let Jesus renounce it. But if you were in denial about it, then Jesus is simply going to keep asking you the question until you come to the end of yourself and finally throw yourself on Him. He's undone by it. Look too at this story. It appears that Peter has decided he's going to go back to his old life, doesn't it? Because he's not hanging in Jerusalem anymore. He's back up in Galilee. That's where he's from. And he's back out on the Sea of Galilee fishing. That's where we first met him. He's back to his old life. My guess is he assumes, listen, what I've done, that can't be undone. I'm disqualified. Jesus is going to entrust other people. He's resurrected. I'll worship him. I'll praise him. But I'm going to have to watch from the sidelines the rest of this. And Jesus, being incredible, recreates the exact scene of Peter's first calling in the same moment. Doesn't he? Do you remember Peter's first call to ministry? What happens? He's out on the boat, fishing all night, catching nothing. Jesus says, hey, cast on the other side. And we have this moment where Peter's like, uh, dude, you are not a fisherman. He doesn't say that, but we get that kind of insight. He's like, but Rabbi, I'll do what you say. And there's this massive catch of fish. So much so then it says that the nets begin to break. Catch the language here this time? They're not breaking anymore. And Peter (laughs) rushes in. Do you remember what Peter says the first time at the catch of fish? Lord, I'm unworthy. (laughs) Do you remember? All of this stuff has got to be going through Peter's head at this moment. And then what is Jesus telling him each time? Feed my sheep. It's it's weird. It's bizarre, isn't it? It's only weird and bizarre because we live in 2024. It would have made perfect sense then but it especially makes perfect sense if you understand what Jesus is telling Peter and calling him to do. Because who is the good shepherd? Who feeds the sheep? Jesus does. That's him. But Jesus had already told Peter, you're going to have a prominent role in my kingdom. Do you remember Peter's big confession of who Jesus was? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, your name is Simon, but now it's Peter or Petros, stone, and on this rock, I will build my church. Jesus is saying to Peter, feed my sheep. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. Who are the sheep? The other dudes. It's the other disciples. They're the sheep. And here's Peter, who claimed he would love him more than these, failed miserably, and now is being invited back into the same position that he thought he was disqualified from. Incredible. Stunning. And yet, exactly right. Moreover, how does the whole story end? Jesus says two words to Peter. Follow me. The very same way it all started. Full and complete restoration. Here's what I want you to hear, friends. It's not just that Jesus forgave him and is allowing him back in. Here's what I think. Peter is now ready to do the things that Jesus had always been calling him to. Before this whole thing had happened, he actually wouldn't have been ready. He would have been big mouth Peter with lots of things to say The guy who talked the talk and didn't walk the walk. And yet, everything we read from Peter past this, even though he and Paul seem to butt heads from time to time, is a person fully submitted 
to the true shepherd. That's the kind of leader we want. That's the kind of person we want. Someone who has been profoundly transformed by the gospel, not someone who can say the big things in the big moment, but someone who we can trust to lead us. And then, of course, he's transformed from talk to walk, right? Peter, before this, is known by his bold claims. Sometimes he gets them right. Sometimes he gets them wrong. Can I get an amen, right? That's for some of us too. Whether we're loud or quiet, sometimes we get it royally right, and sometimes we get it royally wrong, don't we? That was Peter. But after this, he's profoundly known by his love. The very thing that Jesus calls him to. So much so that when he writes his gospel, or when he writes his, his letter, I should say, Peter shares his story so others can write gospels. When he writes his letters, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, 1 Peter especially, he has a lot to say about what? Shepherding the flock. <laughs> Why? Because that's who God had called him to be through Jesus. Incredible. Incredible transformation. Friends, how do we make sense of this for us now? For many of you, you are in a relationship with Jesus. You have known Him. You've experienced his salvation through Him. But my guess is you still are carrying around lots of baggage. Jesus is regularly and persistently but unforcefully asking you repetitive questions. Do you love me? But underneath that it is, do you, you want to keep carrying that? You don't have to. You can be done with that. Or he's asking you, do you love me? But underneath he's actually asking, do you know that I love you? Do you know that I'm not finished with you? Do you know that I was never expecting perfection from you? Do you know that I have the power to transform you? All of us at some level are carrying shame that has the ability to paralyze us in a moment's notice. And none of us have to. But Jesus does not force His transformation on us. He patiently and persistently invites us to embrace it. It took Peter three questions. It typically takes me way more. <laughs> My guess is it might be taking you more than that too. But perhaps this morning, that thing that you're carrying, you've been carrying it from when you were a teenager. You've been carrying it from when you were first married. You've been carrying it from just a couple of weeks ago. Whatever it is, like Jesus does not define you by it. He defines you by His love for Him. And He desires to set you free from it. And that freedom could be yours. But He will never force Himself on you. He'll just persistently nudge you. Hey, can we talk? Do you love me more than these? You know that I love you. No, can, can we deal with the real thing? In the same way for many of us, we look at our lives and think, well, gosh, there are a whole lot of people who could do this a whole lot better than me, so I guess I'll watch from the sidelines while the professionals do their thing. I've got news for you. Most of you by now, by all the professionals who have failed like way worse than Peter, by now hopefully you should know the professionals are you. Right? Whoever you might think is professional or super holy, they're, they're wildly broken. They just have a public persona that would never let that be exposed. You are not meant to sit on the sidelines. In the same way that Peter, or Jesus called Peter, He's called you. Different role. Same kingdom. Don't dismiss that call. Don't disqualify yourself from it. Don't think you've earned your way out of something you could have never earned your way into. Imagine Peter 
as he walked to his crucifixion, thinking about the ways in which God used him in the days and months and years from his restoration to the moment of his crucifixion. So to us. But if you want to be set free, and if you want to be in for the kingdom of God, Jesus has a hard message for you and for me. That hard message, there's two words, right? Follow me. (laughs) It's not easy. That's why follow me is expressed in a different way in Matthew chapter 16, 24, where Jesus said, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he or she must take up his or her cross and follow me. Anyone who wants to gain his life will lose it but those who lose their life will gain it. What is he saying? That full life actually comes from submission to Jesus as king. We give so much effort to building a life for ourselves in this world. And I'm not suggesting you those things are wrong or bad. I'm just telling you they cannot give you the thing you're longing for. Jesus actually says when you come to the end of yourself is when you start actually living full life. Because he's the means by which it comes. So what does it look like for you to pick up your cross and follow Jesus? Well, I've got news for you. I haven't the foggiest idea, right? Here's where we get to that strange interaction between Peter and Jesus and John where apparently John is eavesdropping on this conference. John never gets in trouble, right? I guess because he's writing the gospel. I don't understand. Peter's getting corrected. John's eavesdropping like a good younger brother. And Jesus is breaking the news to him. Hey, you're going to die by crucifixion. It's going to be glorious. It's going to be hard. And Peter's like, what about that guy? What's going to happen to him? And Jesus is like, doesn't matter. Sometimes the harder news for us isn't the call that Jesus has put on us. It's the call Jesus has put on us in comparison to the call he's put on someone else. And in so doing, what we're really saying is, is my role going to give me glory? Not, is my role going to glorify God by walking the way of Christ for others. Some of you are walking through the valley of the shadow of death or have or will in the future. My guess is one of the questions you will ask is, why is this happening to me? As a pastor, I don't have good answers for that. I have theological truths. They aren't always comforting. Where comfort comes is that Jesus walks where he's called us to go. So if you want intimacy with Jesus, you walk where he's walking, not where you want him to walk. We take up our cross and we follow him. And we find full life. But none of that is possible if we're carrying our own crosses. Is it? Our own self-loathing, our own shame, our own self-criticism, our own disqualifications. If we've got our hands full with that, then we can't do the other. Jesus, in His grace, removes all of it from Peter and puts in his hand a new, still incredibly challenging, but ultimately life-giving mission. Friends, I think it is just the same for us. You pray with me?
Jesus, we use big words and we say big things and we We gesticulate and we articulate and we do all of the things to try to say that your love and your grace and your mercy are enormous. They're big. They're, we can never comprehend them. And yet, for many of us, we don't take you up on it. Or we take you up on it just a little bit. And we're exhausted and we're tired. And we've been dragging around our stuff for years. And you are gently and persistently inviting us to forgiveness. I pray, by your Spirit, that we would step out of our shame, step out of our self disqualification by the means of your crucifixion and resurrection, embrace new creation life and the transformation it brings and allow ourselves to be honest to goodness, forgiven, and watch it radically transform us. Forgive us for trying to bury it. Forgive us for trying to just move past it and forget it. Forgive us for trying to earn our keep instead of letting you graciously and mercifully forgive us. In the days and the weeks to come, might we piece by piece lay down the baggage we carry and find the full life, I pray in your name. Amen.